All right. Um, hello, everybody. I'm glad you're here. Um, last week, the global management consulting firm McKinsey and Company reinforced our nation's post COVID-19 economic recovery hinges on completely on the return of the customer. The future, they said, is all about reaching three objectives. One, getting better at predictive customer demand, being alert to all the ways businesses might increase sales, and responding quickly to changes and opportunities. So coincidentally, today's 24-hour Dallas webinar, Happy Hour, is called Customer Trends, Customer Confidence, and Keeping It Clean, and is about all three of those objectives. 24 Hours Dallas is a, a new all-volunteer organization, nonprofit, which has as its mission, let's create a safe, vibrant, and a diverse nighttime culture for businesses, residents, and guests. Our focus is uh, Dallas's nighttime economy, those industries and businesses and organizations that thrive at night and boost our city's tax base. Um, the arts and cultural organizations, restaurants, hotels, special events, music venues, tourism sites, festivals, all of these boost the experience of being and living in Dallas. And of course, our focus is also on the people who enjoy the night and work at night. Today, our uh, webinar guests are going to be from Visit Dallas, um, Dallas Tour Dallas's Tourism and Convention Bureau, Michael Rudowski, who is a Senior Director of Research and Business Analysis, and uh, a fellow uh, customer metrics um, fan. I started to say nerd, but I don't know Michael that well. Uh, and uh, um, this afternoon, we learned that the Executive Director of ISSA's Global Bio-Risk uh, Advisory Council is going to be unable to join us after all, but in her place, we have Kim Althoff, ISSA's uh, Vice President of Sales, Trade Show, and Media, and with her, I hope, will be GABC's Director of Program Management, Stephen Earhart. Now, ISSA, for those who do not know, is the premier trade association for the cleaning industry worldwide. Also with us is Raul Santian. He's a senior partner of experience manager, also with Visit Dallas. His jobs include, as I confirmed with them earlier, tailoring Dallas to perfectly fit the expectations of our city's guests. Uh, my name is Randall White. I'm a 24-hour Dallas uh, volunteer. Our sponsors today are um, the Greater Dallas Restaurant Association, Visit Dallas, of course, and Premium Parking, which you'll hear a little bit more about later. We're also streaming this webinar on the 24 Hour Dallas Facebook page and we'll post it within 24 hours, of course, on the website 24hourdallas.org. Now, before we start, bathrooms are down the hall. Um, and since it's happy hour, I hope you all have brought your favorite beverage. Mine happens to be unsweet iced tea. And uh, there will be time for our panelists to respond to any questions you may have toward the end of this hour. Feel free to submit your questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and uh, we'll get to as many as we can. Now, for our panelists, for our speakers today, let me tell you who's on the call. We have, uh, uh, I reviewed the list of those who have uh, uh, registered. We have hoteliers, we have restaurateurs, we have representatives from tourism and cultural organizations. We have uh, uh, accounting professionals, several of them that are tied to the hospitality industry. We have some uh, building operators from some of the uh, uh, premier uh, buildings in the city of Dallas. We have some uh, business district and uh, business organization staffers. And then we have some transportation pros and then a great handful of our volunteers from 24 Hour Dallas. So we'll begin with Michael Rodowski and Michael, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Randall, for the introduction. Let me see if I can get my uh, screen sharing here. Okay, right, so uh, for you all today, I have um, some great information to share from a couple of our research partners. Um, the first part is going to focus on cons uh, consumer traveler sentiment, and then the second really focusing on visitor behavior into the market and, and travel to our area. So regarding traveler sentiment, uh, Destination Analyst has been doing a weekly uh, traveler sentiment study since early March of potential U.S. travelers. 
Um, they've been one of our, our top partners with a lot of our marketing intelligence stud, uh, studies and focus groups, things like that, for our marketing efforts over the past few years. And they, they do a really uh, great job with everything that they do. For this, for this consumer sentiment study, they really they broke the U.S. down into four regions, and they do uh, 1,200 studies every week so they can get a reliable uh, you know, pulse of what's going on out, out in the marketplace and allows also some uh, segmentation views into you know, looking into the different regions and if they may res be responding differently to the virus. So looking at future expectations of the virus, you know, paints an interesting picture. Unfortunately, the recent surges in cases across the U.S. has resulted in a worsening view from potential travelers over the last month, but it's still better than the low points that we saw in early April. I'd like to point out, you know, that the consumer outlook was, you know, did rapidly improve throughout April as, you know, as we had the shutdown. So hopefully we can see that trend resume once we see the cases start to plateau and decrease, you know, throughout the country. Um, in the middle of the chart, you can kind of see like in, in the early parts of May where you know, the, some of the states started to increase. There was a lot of media coverage about it was too soon, uh, caused a little bit of increase in, in you know, people's concerns. Uh, but that quickly kind of you know, pulled back over the next month, which had resulted in a lot of increasing metrics and visitation numbers that I'll show you a little bit later on in the uh, presentation. With worsening outlook, you know, there's three aspects really I think we can review of traveler sentiment and the impact of what that outlook is doing. First is taking a look at those that are indicating they're going to avoid travel completely until the situation blows over, you know, and, and it becomes a thing of the past. Unfortunately, after two months of improving levels, you know, in this metric, the recent surges cause it to increase again. Currently with, uh, you know, about six and 10, claiming they're gonna avoid travel until the end of the pandemic. Second is a view on the effects of really the, the, you know, what the vaccine will have on travel and people's intentions as we start to hear more news on progress towards the development of one. Uh, right now, the impact is at its highest point since destination analysts included it in their survey about midway through April. You know, the increasing, you know, levels is probably due to a combination of both the worsening outlook of the virus right now, as well as there's a lot of, you know, news stories on progress of, you know, development and success of some trials and things like that in the media. You know, as a result, I think, you know, the, the, a successful vaccine and release into the market is going to be critical for getting the most concerned travelers to kind of return to their normal, you know, consumer activities and habits. And then third is really looking at, you know, the expected uh, levels of, of travelers in the fall, or, you know, taking trips in the fall. While almost 50% indicated they, they would travel uh, during the fall season two months ago, now only one in three are expecting to travel uh, this fall. As the, you know, as the surges really, you know, hit down on a lot of their you know, confidence levels. I'd like to make a side note here: the impact on Dallas uh, tourism and, the, you know, our tourism businesses and the meeting industries. When all the news on the virus was coming, you know, came up in March, and we started to see, you know, a rapid, you know, deterioration towards the later part of March, uh, we saw a lot of meeting cancellations for the immediate months of, you know, April and May. Okay, but while, while a lot of them were canceling, many were also rescheduling their events into the second half of 2020 and some into future years. Um, we're now you know, expecting cancellations to continue throughout the end of the year, and, and really they're not they're going to be scheduled for future years, but it's not really a pushback anymore. So we're expecting business levels really now not to start really returning to normal until midway through 2021, and, but we should start seeing some small meetings come back in the first quarter. So it's going to be a challenging time to get through, especially for you know restaurants and tourism businesses that rely on events from our from you know from conferences, conventions, as well as you know for parties, things like that. As you know, we try to bring as much as we can into the fold. Uh, moving from there, it's kind of looking at personal safety, and you know personal safety continues to be a concern of travelers. It's imperative that both destinations and businesses do what they can to make their consumers feel safe and more comfortable with visiting their locations. Um, I have some slides a little bit later on showing the impacts you know, of masks and, and other aspects and what we can do to help that. But while the level of concern has been reducing since April, we've seen the numbers really start to jump back up for the past month. So, you know, the big surge in cases, you know, reporting up all the parties and you know, the youth of, you know, of America really starting to pick up on some of the cases. When we drill down and see you know, who's more confident than others, we do see younger people are still a little bit more confident. Uh, men are a little bit more confident than women. And 
uh, Republicans are generally more comp uh, confident than Democrats on their, their safety. And then really looking at that, while people are concerned for themselves, they're even more concerned for their family and friends. And this makes sense when we figure that the virus, you know, obviously is much more harmful to those that have underlying conditions or, you know, are a little bit older. So people are, are concerned about bringing it back to their friends and family, you know, wanting, not wanting to visit, you know, people that may potentially, you know, have more of a, a risk if they, cap, you know, if they catch the virus. Uh, but overall, the levels are, you know, for every person who is, you know, feels uh, not concerned, there's six people that do feel concerned, which is a you know, relatively high level ratio of that. And then um, segueing off of that into personal finances, you know, we fortunately here we have seen an improvement in the ratio from the start of the, you know, the virus back in March when really the whole country shut down, where we were seeing, you know, uh, five people concerned for everyone that was not concerned. That has, you know, rapidly increased over the last couple of months, especially for those that have not, you know, have been able to maintain their jobs and keep moving forward. They're a little more confident that they'll reach through as we start getting closer to things like vaccines and, and getting more, you know, more clarity as a, as, as a six forward. But even with that, you know, comfort level with personal finances, there's still a very high level of concern for the national economy as a whole. What you're seeing here is almost 90% of, of consumers indicated that they're concerned, you know, what's going to happen with the country's economy and different levels. And obviously, there's a lot of, a lot of conversations going on nationally right, right now in, in Congress of stimulus bills and things like that. You know, but the prolonged effects of unemployment impacts on state, local budgets, you know, all have not really been felt yet. So, but the, you know, we're sitting at about for every person who's not concerned, there are 15 that are. So it's going to be a very important aspect as we move into the later part of this year, and we just need to be very mindful. Um, of, if this starts impacting, you know, personal finances and things like that, and the impact that could have on our on our phone or travel. Um, moving beyond that, you know, looking at really the perceived safety of travel activities, and I'm just going to, you know, focus mostly on the ones on top and on the bottom. So the people are most concerned about, you know, gatherings of large people, which makes sense with the reporting. So large sporting events, you know, music, theater venues. Um, you know, anything again where, where people get together. Uh, conference and conventions are pretty high in that list, you know, with almost 80% of people feeling that it's an unsafe activity. Um, flipping to that, really looking towards the bottom of this chart is a lot of the things that, you know, we do have a lot of these attributes in our, in our visitation to Dallas. You know, uh, dining in a restaurant is below, you know, below average, uh, shopping, visiting friends and family, outdoor recreation, and just taking a road trip. And this is, you know, something we've talked about quite a bit with our marketing efforts, where we've shifted a lot of our marketing efforts to focus even more so than usual on people taking road trips and staycations, you know, as people are trying to stay closer to home and, you know, keep the things that they're more comfortable with. To give a historical perspective, so this is really, you know, this is the overall average where we're currently sitting at, you know, all this different activities, the average was 60% that felt that they were unsafe. You know, back really when we did we got into the shutdowns, we were at the we were at the high level of 72%. Uh, that decreased significantly into the early parts of June. You know, before this surge uh, started again, but we're seeing it you know climb back up a little bit, settling back in. But, you know, overall we're still better than we were in April, but it's you know some semi concerning as we move forward. We've seen a lot of our you know our hotel metrics and visitation numbers and 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 mobile NF show we've had a decrease in visitation the past couple of weeks, although they seem to have leveled off this past week. So it'll be important as we move forward. This obviously will impact all the tourism businesses in the city. And this is, a, you know, a really interesting thing because travel is, you know, Americans hold travel very close, you know, to their heart on, you know, wanting to do it with their families. And it's, it's a big part of, you know, experiencing life for many people. So this question is really asking, you know, if a good friend had asked you to take a weekend getaway with them in the next month, so that's real soon, how many, you know, are you, are you excited to take that trip? And, you know, this number is, it, is that it's not at a bad level compared to where it's been right now, sitting at 40%, but it is slightly lower than 45% than the week prior. Um, but, you know, that's still showing that almost half of people are st would still get excited and wanting to take a trip if the opportunity, you know, uh, presented itself. And, you know, obviously that's a key part of what we're trying to do to get people to come to Dallas and, and see some of the, you know, go to the restaurants and all the different nightlife and attractions that we have to offer. 
looking how that goes through time, you can see, again, you know, it's, it kind of was at a low point in April, sh shooting up rapidly through Memorial Day weekend, which is really where travel in our area really started to jump up quite a bit from, from the levels, you know, from April, March and April. Uh, but we've seen that number start to start to pull back, like as we were mentioning, as people are starting to get a little bit more concerned with the cases and things like that. And again, as we watch, and the things like the mask orders have seemed like they potentially could be slowing some of the some of the spread. We'll have to see the impact moving forward. Uh, finally, that really looks at you know openness to travel information. So this is like if we you know if we're giving you know marketing messages or, or giving assets or information to travelers, you know how receptive are they to receiving the information? And this goes off to any you know any any business as well to kind of look at this as you know. And again, it's the similar similar curve where we're seeing up you know uptick in some memorial day and then fall back recently. Um, it's important to know that where people are most open to receiving this is, is in established channels. So it's not, you know, they're very receptive through websites and emails and our social media channels, but not as open to, you know, uh, just, just uh, you know, internet ads and rent, you know, different text messages. But so it's really, again, I think that gets driven a lot by the comfort level. So that's existing customer bases, you know, things where people are very, you know, familiar, they're comfortable with you. So, you know, that's very important to notice as you look at communicating with your potential customers. And then really looking to see how travelers are, you know, feeling about masks, their interaction, both in their communities as well as when they travel. You know, the first question really that, they, that they've been asking is in this environment, do you think people should be wearing a face mask when they're out in public in general? And this is regardless of if it's on a trip or, you know, at their home areas. And overwhelmingly 80% agree at this point that people should wear a mask whether out in public as a lot of, you know, public officials have been getting a high the concept and we're hearing a lot of, you know, different, you know, news talk on and things like that. Um, so that's, you know, encouraging, especially as there's been some more and more studies coming out showing that they can effectively see a slow bit of spread. Only about 7% indicated that they would be, that they disagree that people should be wearing a mask in public. Coming back that, you know, asking about, you know, the question here is in my community, you know, too many people are not wearing face masks in the public. So this is really saying, hey, you know, they want people in their public to be wearing more than they currently are. And about half the people are indicating that they think people in the community should be wearing them more while just, you know, just one in five, you know, disagree with that aspect. And that kind of comes to the next question with really like how often do you personally wear a mask in public? And two in three people are indicating that they wear a mask always when they're out and about with one in three, you know, kind of split between a variety of different, you know, the levels usually sometimes rarely and never about what they're doing. So the next slide um, kind of gets into that 33% and asks, why are you not wearing masks? And really, I mean, the the overwhelming thing here, and this probably goes into that, you know, sometimes is that it's not always necessary. So I think when people are feeling that they're, you know, properly social distanced, they don't think that having the mask on is necessary. You know, about people forgetting is another, you know, higher cause. And then you can see it isn't necessary that they don't think masks, you know, don't work is at 18%. And just that 18% is just, you know, 18% of the one third that, you know, are not always wearing a mask out in public. So it represents about 6% or one in, about one in 20 of the, you know, the U.S. consumer population or not. And then really, you know, asking why you're traveling, you know, so saying if you're, if you're going to be taking a, a road trip in the next six months, you know, how, you know, which would you be likely to do? And you really, you know, wearing a face mask is, is top in the list. And this is very close to the 66% that indicated that they always wear it. But almost 70% are going to say that they're going to wear a mask on their trip. You know, over six and 10 are going to follow social distancing guidelines. Many are still avoiding crowds. And again, that, that, you know, goes back to, you know, the activities of, you know, large gatherings, sporting events, things like that are most concerned along with conventions. And people are going to try their best to carry hand sanitizer, um, you know, and just pr practice personal hygiene. As you can see there, the fifth one is really eating, you know, only restaurant takeout service, which is 37%. Fortunately, that leaves over six and 10 that are, you know, would still, you know, eat at a restaurant, you know, at the restaurant themselves without takeout. So there's still a good mix there. Um, then really the question goes, you know, because there's been a lot of talk about different areas and the mandates on masks and things like that. And when, you know, the question is really what bits of, describes you about, you know, if the justice was to require you to wear a mask, would that make you happy? And again, it falls in line with really what we're seeing in the, the other questions that about two thirds of people are happy with the mask requirements while about, you know, 10% are unhappy. 
And, you know, I think that division pretty much marks through most of these slides. And you can see again, but then the second question is how, how happy would you be about if there's tickets or fines? And while most of that, you know, 67% that thought it was a good idea, probably are still, you know, happy about that, you know, it's a little bit lower, 57%. So about 10% of people moving into the unhappy that were unhappy. So they, there is a component of people that while they want areas to have mask requirements, they still are not as happy about them getting fined if they're not. And I think that may go into some of those people who kind of feel that, you know, they're going to wear them when they think it's useful, you know, when they're not socially distanced. So this is actually from, you know, uh, one of the prior waves that destination analysts did, but I thought it was very relevant to, to you know, this general conversation. And the question really was posed to, to travelers, both about hotels and airlines. And I want to focus a little bit more on the left side, which is the hotel side. And this is really, you know, asking, you know, what, you know, when you're staying in a hotel, you know, what should the hotel be doing to make you feel, you know, safer and, and you know, better about your stay? And, you know, the things that are at the top here, you know, they, they make a lot of sense. So obviously the most likely indicating was that, the, you know, that the business went out of the way to provide uh, hand sanitizer face masks, which of course would, you know, enable everyone across the board to utilize them more increasing their utilization. Second was to have, you know, cleaning and sanitizing procedures well explained. And that's one of the reasons Raul is going to talk about this a little, you know, a little bit too with a certification program with ISSA. Um, so that way consumers understand and are comfortable that the businesses are doing everything they can to make sure that everything is sanitized properly and that they're doing it the right way. Um, and obviously uh, making sure you help health screening the employees and obviously even having visible, visible cleaning activities. So, you know, guests can, can there's just an extra level of belief for some. And then obviously, you know, doing the right thing with social distancing, things like that across the board. And it's all about, again, making consumers feel more comfortable, which will, will keep them coming back more. I'm moving from there. I'm just going to, this is a, a separate uh, study that Destination Analyst does. And it's really, they say, it's, they do this a couple times a year. And it's essentially designed really looking at overall outlook of people's travel habits. They've been doing it uh, since 2006 which is useful here because we can kind of uh, compare the impact on uh, consumer travel intent uh, back in the financial crisis in 2008, as well as with the current pandemic. And it's, you know, each time they do it is we have 2000 and a couple, I pulled out a couple of questions here that I thought were relevant. First is really just saying, Hey, over the next 12 months, are you going to be more or less likely to take a leisure travel than you did in the, the most recent past 12 months? And unfortunately, you know, for about 44%, are saying that they're going to be less likely to travel compared to only 16% that they're going to be more likely to travel. As you know, a lot of people are, you know, they're staying home, obviously, you know, with all of the different travel restrictions shut down, personal, there's a lot of concerns that are keeping that, you know, down. When we look at that kind of historical uh, context, and this is actually spending levels, which is very similar, you can see how, you know, we were at pretty much a, a pretty low level of people looking to spend less in the next year, but we had a, a very quick jump up all the way from 9% up to almost half of people before, you know, following a couple points uh, recently. And you can kind of, kind of compare it. The levels from this pandemic are, are much more extreme than what we saw in the Great Recession and our forecasts and conversation, you know, are revolving around that. This is, you know, much, much stronger than the impacts that we had uh, in the past uh, downturns. And then this really is looking at, you know, when people do travel or when they're out and about spending money, you know, how much more budget conscious are you going to be, you know, than you were before this, before the coronavirus became, you know, an issue for everyone. And 40% of people are indicating that they're going to be more budget conscious on their trips, you know, watching what they spend. And that again lines up with concerns for both personal finances as well as the concerns for the national economy with only 7% indicating they're going to be less conscious of their budgets. Shifting off that, it's really asking, hey, you know, and this goes back into that excitement to travel, you know, how many people are going to make leisure travel a budget priority? And, you know, it's 34.7% are going to make at, at least some level of leisure travel a priority of their budget over the next year. Um, you know, kind of compare that to about, you know, a little bit more than a third of people that are going to make it a very low priority. And to understand what that 34.7% you know, means in context, it's looking historically over the past couple of years and what they've been indicating, it shed some light on that. Uh, generally, you see it kind of hovering around 60% uh, in most studies about making a priority. So we're talking we're currently at a little bit more than half of that. It's, it's very interesting that the 70% you know, that we saw back in January, um, many of the hotels and, and our own numbers have indicated that we were having record months you know, immediately preceding the, the uh, 
the start of the virus. You know, our, our February was as, was what our on a day, daily average was the best month we've ever had in hotel revenues collected in the city. And obviously, it quickly dropped off. You know, from that, as this is just you know kind of came out of nowhere and you know, just really devastated the hotel industry. And then finally, just looking at, you know, in the next 12 months, how many trips will you take? I think this is important. One thing I didn't call out before on the activities is there's a lot of concern about the, you know, uh, city destinations and urban areas about travel just because there's a lot of people in general on them. I think this is, you know, a little bit of a better picture. While cities and metro areas are generally at the very top destination of where people are going to visit over the next period, um, we did fall, you know, from 74% down to 50, but we're still one of the most likely, you know, in general places to be visited. So there still will be some people coming, you know, throughout our leisure purposes, things like that. So, you know, we'll have to keep that coming for us. So rolling off that, I just wanted to then kind of give a kind of a summary on what we've seen since the start of the pandemic. And this is uh, th this is our partner arrival is too. They do a lot of uh, mobile analytics. So let me kind of talk about how some of that works. They, there, it's an app based uh, data program. So essentially it's, it does not matter which carrier people have you know, with their mobile device, it's, it's all shared data through all the, you know, a network of th th thousands of apps that contain uh, location data. This is, it's a private, it's compliant with the privacy laws. It's completely anonymous um, to who the people are. We just get, you know, aggregated data, but it's, it's also very, it's rigorously balanced to give an accurate representation throughout the country of where, you know, where people are coming from and what they're doing when they come here. This kind of just showing in you know, last year, really where all of our arrivals came from. It's a heat map. It's differentiated by two colors. Generally, the pink is just uh, people who came here that were not exposed to our messaging, so they didn't come to our website or they didn't see any of our digital ads. While the blue is people who you know who had a connection to visit Dallas, our digital materials. You know, so we do, we focus a lot of our marketing efforts in the immediate five-hour drive uh, radius, as that's where a lot of our visitation comes from and where we have the most we're most likely to kind of uh, convert them into visitors. So understanding what's happened to the arrival since the start of the, the, the pandemic, the, the red line there is really the, the seven day average daily cases uh, in, in Texas um, for the, you know, the, new, the new case counts. And the green is obviously a visitation path. Um, you can see we had a very rapid fall off from, you know, from around March into April. And we've, we were starting to see a slow line recovery through June before it falls off a little bit right at the end of June as some of the cases started to peak up. Um, just to call out a couple of specific dates here, you know, you have, we have a really big event in February at our convention center. It's National Chair Association Cheerleader event, it brings in a, a lot of people into the city. So that's where you're seeing a really big spike, you know, that appears on February 29th. Most of our visitation spikes are on the weekends. That's why it looks, you see a lot of up and down. That's for the most part, it's, you know, those are Friday and Saturdays. So that's, you know, when people come into both our hotels as well as friends and family stays, but through private, private residencies throughout the city. Um, Finally, you can kind of see that one peak in May, on, on, which is Memorial Day. We saw a big, you know, pickup in Memorial Day traffic. And like, again, I mentioned that before. That's where we started to see a lot of our visitation kind of come back. It fell back a little bit after that because that was obviously a holiday weekend before continuing to rise, where June 27th had actually gotten, I'm sorry, June 20th had actually gotten above the level of Memorial Day. And unfortunately, we did not see that same bump with July 4th with all the cases as they were really, you know, peaking at that point. So that's just kind of a monthly look at comparing to prior year and really where we're looking at. So you can see, yeah, again, you know, we were, you know, the effect on the, on the panel, the trips that were attracted to our destination when we were down in March. And, and again, the second half of March is really when we started to, to experience the drop, you know, the very low levels in April as we were in shutdown and, and you know, most things were really brought down. And then you can see really May and June really start, you know, started to pop back up and get this, you know, a little bit more than a half in total the visitation levels. Coming off of that, then really just looking at how does how does the Dallas area stack up against Texas? Uh, in general, we're the number one visitor destination in Texas. You know, we generally have more than up to we we, can, we gather more than one in three trips in Texas uh, to, to the DFW area. Um, we're still holding pretty strong as being in that number one spot, although our share has shifted down a little bit. As you can see in the, in the blue line falling, as you know, more people have dispersed some of the more rural areas and away from cities and be associations that pulled up in the past couple of months, disrupting that share just a little bit. And then really, how, you know, how has the DFW visitor changed the past three months? Um, you know, 
in general, about half of our visits come from in-state visitors, you know, to, to DFW. Uh, that share has increased to just over 70%. As you can see on the right chart, that's showing the actual visitation levels. We've only, our, our business from in-state visitors has only decreased by 7% during this. Um, that's in comparison to, you know, a, a drop of 70% from the areas that, are, you know, all the states that are black in that map that are not, you know, in our in close region, right? Uh, obviously, Oklahoma was, was also not down quite as much as the remaining states. And again, that's, people are keeping it really kind of close to home and not making the same type of distance. But overall, right now, 90% of our trips are coming from the five states that are green on that map. Looking at a little bit more of a you know, smaller level, this is looking at individual DMAs and, and where we're, you know, where the share is coming from. Uh, and again, you heard me mention staycation before as, as an important component. Because DFW is so big, you know, it's possible for people to, to travel um, within it and be considered a trip a visitor. Uh, the way we, tra we track visitors, it's, it's a national definition of 50 miles traveled outside of daily routine. Um, and what we're seeing is, you know, the DFW visitors actually, we're seeing more of them this year than we, we were this time last year. You know, and it's about like a 30% growth from prior year, but the share has increased from 5% up to 15% because we're getting a lot more, you know, that very regional area. But looking down the line, these are all of our top regional uh, uh, markets and every one of them has increased share, but the ones that are closest have increased share the most. So, you know, Tyler, uh, Waco, Wichita Falls have all had significant growth in their share, Sherman, area as well. So a lot of our efforts are where we want to be, you know, we should be extra focused on, on people within the two to three hour range in general when we do our marketing things like that. Looking at our airports, because while, you know, road trips and, and car travel is, you know, doing fairly well, you know, our, the airline and, you know, industry and travelers to, you know, from their airports is significantly down. You can see, you know, they were, they were, they felt pretty much right all of most way down to zero, you know, in uh, April. And they've had a small amount, you know, small amount of growth, but still fairly low. The traffic at the airport is still strong as they're very, is very high for a lot of connection destinations, things like that. As America has made us a major, even more of a major hub as they've, you know, reworked their network in the country. So we, the capabilities there, the capacities there, which will be great for us as we pull, come out of the pandemic. You know, we're gonna have a lot of flights, all of, we're maintaining all of our, all of our nonstop destinations throughout the country. We haven't lost any of them. So what usually is an advantage for us is going to grow that much more as it's going to be extremely easy for travelers to still to get to Dallas in general um, once the you know once the pandemic kind of you know is in its later stages. Um, off of that, just looking at our top out of state markets, I just really wanted to call out you know, here. You know we have our our visitation always is generally we have a very heavy focus on the re, you know the immediate region and I just mentioned like Oklahoma City, Tulsa, Shreveport, and Little Rock which is four of our top six markets and markets that we advertise to every year, they're almost all predominantly uh, drive market. You know, they almost all come, so they we're not gonna have the impact in the airline industry and people being, you know, worried about for lying is not impacting those markets. Uh, you know, obviously we will have with the remaining ones, but it still remains a strength for us. The people are still, again, easy to get to by a big percentage of our visitors. And then just really looking at, you know, how has the behavior changed of, you know, of people doing day visits and day trips in our area? And what we've seen is a significant change in share where people are really, you know, moving away from some of, some of the attractions. Obviously, they, there hasn't been baseball, you know, games for, for fans to go to. So that one could kind of pretty much fell down to zero. Uh, but shopping malls, you know, are, are grabbing a much heavier, you know, fair of the share as, you know, they remained open, you know, compared to, you know, the, the zoos and attractions that we track. Um, to follow that up, I just want to kind of show like this is this we've we've zoned a lot of our like our nightlight, our dining and cultural districts. So this is showing really activity of Bishop Arts, Deep Ellum, Knox, the Knox Center's in the restaurant area, uh, Trinity Groves, and the Uptown uh, region. And what this is showing really, you know, pre pre pandemic levels in January and February, so what kind of looked like somewhat normal, and then what we've seen since. You've seen most of them kind of just completely disappear uh, from track levels, you know, from that late March through April before it's starting to come back at some, you know, some level uh, in May once we started to reopen. Now, obviously with a lot of the dining restaurants, a lot of the nighttime, you know, experiences that can be had there. Um, you know, Uptown has seen a little bit, you know, a stronger recovery than some of the other zones, but the ones that are heavier dining have a bet, have gained back more of their share, especially when we incorporate some of the, you know, some of the local uh, visitation 
uh, in addition to the added area. So, you know, places like uh, Trinity Groves, Knox Henderson, and Uptown are, are at a better point than, say, T. Bellum. Um, I mentioned locals. So, this is really looking at all the districts combined and their activity, activity levels by both uh, visitors and the local. And local is really focused on people that are visiting these, these locations that are it's out of out of their normal routine. So if it's people that work there, they're not counted. If it's people that are there all the time, they're not counted. So this is people, you know, truly going out to, to go to a dining location or go to, you know, a venue in one of these locations. And this is showing from the start of the year, uh, seven day, you know, seven day activity or from, so this is the week ending on each of the dates on the bottom. And you can see again, rapid fall off, you know, very low levels in, in April. Uh, I mean, really recovery to, you know, close to about half of what's normal when we incorporate them with the, the locals into, to, into the different areas. And you see, you know, the follow up in July after a case has started to search. And just kind of to, to close it out is really just looking at, I, I wanted to share just a couple of different metrics that we're tracking just to really see where we are at and compare them to where we were in February. So what this is, this is an index we've created where we're looking at, you know, the at average business level in February, and that's the dotted blue line at the top, which equals, you know, is 100. And then each of these other lines is four metrics that we track on a weekly basis to show at what, basically what percentage of business were we at compared to what we were in, in April. So you can see, like, for example, the, you know, the, our website demand, the, the, the light blue line, which is basically that's all of our internet search traffic to, to visit Dallas.com, fell down to a low of about 20% in early April. And, you know, that's generally one of our more lead indicators. It's people are searching their trips and searching for things to do. They come there and we see, you know, a lot of the members just respond after that. And you can see they kind of, you know, the website started to really demand grew a little bit faster to reaching levels of 60% before the crisis, uh, before the cases started to increase again a few weeks, you know, about a month ago before it then kind of flowing back. But you see it kind of leveling off there at the very last week into July 18th. Um, we've, and then we've seen some of similar trends. So the red line is really the, the hotel room revenue. Um, we've seen that, you know, obviously bottom out at almost, you know, down over 80% uh, in April and kind of climb back to sitting, sitting, you know, just over 20% now. And then finally, just the orange line is, our, is the mobile arrivals or the track visitation arrivals that, you know, that's kind of the slides I was just showing where we're at. And we're sitting at just about 40% of overall um, visitation to our market. So with that, I'd like to kind of, you know, close on that right now. Thank you very much with that. And uh, next we want to we have uh, Raul come on to really talk about one of the programs that we're working with, with, with uh, ISSA, with the, the uh, feedback program. Uh, can you hear me? Great, great. Thank you, Michael. Uh, appreciate you sharing that information with us. And, uh, Again, we'll, we'll continue. Uh, I'll, I'll start off by introducing myself. My name is Raul Santillana. I'm with Visit Dallas as well. I am uh, the liaison here um, to, uh, to Visit Dallas and GPAC Star. Uh, the purpose of my presentation is basically to kind of tell you why Visit Dallas as a city has uh, chosen to commit to the Clean City Initiative. And then we'll have the team from ISSA and GPAC kind of give you the details of that. So along with a lot of our hotels, partner hotels and city-owned cultural facilities, and uh, as well as the Cape Bailey Hutchinson Convention Center, Visit Dallas, the city of Dallas, and the Dallas uh, Tourism Public Improvement District have really taken seriously its mission of social responsibility by implementing the protocols and mechanisms for sanitation. Now, as we find ourselves trying to figure out how we're gonna get out of this hole that we're in, we wanted to ensure that we were taking all possible measures to control and diminish the effects of COVID-19 and really any other possible uh, germ and pathogen related uh, outbreaks in the future. Um, so referencing the slide that, uh, that Michael showed earlier, um, I'll, I'll pull this up here for you guys. You notice the uh, same thing, even though right here, basically focused on hotel and, and commercial airline travel, really ink, it encompasses the entire hospitality industry. So from point A to Z, when someone comes to our city, we wanna make sure that they're safe. The, from the minute they get off the airplane, uh, into the airport, into their transportation, into the hotel, and then ultimately the restaurants um, that they go to, and then all points in between. 
So what have we done to do that? So we've, we've spoken to a lot of uh, our partners or stakeholders within the city. American Airlines has committed to this program. Um, our hotels, because of the Dallas Tourism Public Improvement District, have also committed to the program, as well as DART and a couple of other entities within the city, as well as city-owned uh, facilities. The city of Dallas has gotten behind the program uh, to make sure that the cultural arts facilities within the city um, have representatives within their staff that are certified and have taken the online courses for GPAC STAR certification. Um, so as you can see, we, we are really trying hard to, to make sure that our guests, and which is our main message here, is that our guests understand fully that when they come to our city, they will be safe. We, are, we wanna reassure them, we wanna have that confidence, and we, most importantly, we want them to have that peace of mind to know that when they come to our city, they've got nothing to worry about. Uh, and that's, that's the main objective of GBAC STAR. Uh, the idea behind it, again, is just to create that reassurance, and, and, and we wanna help with that. And so the reason we we're on, on this uh, presentation today is to encourage our partners, our stakeholders, and our restaurants, and other entities within the city to strongly consider this program um, for their businesses. Because again, it's creating that third layer. Uh, a lot of your businesses are already implementing your own protocols in regards to sanitation, sanitization, and safety. Why not add that third layer of, 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 of again, just a, a good house keeping house a seal of approval, right? That additional layer of comfort and confidence uh, for your clients and consumers so that they know that you're doing any and everything that, that you can possible to assure their safety while they're in, the, in your establishment. And that's the whole purpose behind GBAC STAR. Um, so with that, I'm going to take myself out of the equation and I'd like to uh, present Kim Althoff and Steve um, Earhart with uh, ISSA and GBAC so they can discuss the details of the program with you. So I'll leave the floor to Kim and Steve. Thank you, Raul, very much. And uh, Michael, great presentation. And Randall, thank you for having us today. Um, so first and foremost, um, it's been um, a privilege and an honor to work with Visit Dallas um, as a partner who truly is committed and dedicated in helping all of their incredible partners and establishments reopen. Um, so Steve and myself, we're gonna kind of give you the cliff note version here. We wanna all be respectful of everybody's time. You were so gracious to join us on the call today. Um, but please know we are available to help you answer any questions um, as is your um, But ISSA, as Randall mentioned, we are the, the um, World Red Cleaning Association. We're a not-for-profit. Um, and we are of almost 10 hundred member companies and we span over 105 countries um, and and with that we have always put a value to clean um, and we were last fall very fortunate to bring into the family the global bio risk advisory council um, and that was really to elevate cleaning to a scientific level um, it was to help with the harm, the removal of harmful pathogens, um, infectious disease prevention, um, deep forensic um, cleaning. Um, and little did we know at that point in time last fall that come 2020 into the first quarter that we'd have a pandemic on our hands. Um, so we have partnered with Visit Dallas and, and we are trying to help all of the facilities reopen and recover. And that's literally really providing um, the highest level of protocols, SOPs within the cleaning and disinfecting. So as we talked a little bit here about how ISSA and our presence around the world um, and how excited we are to have the scientific experts. So as Raul was noting, you know, wanting to have that peace of mind and that confidence what the scientific experts lend is that third party accreditation and verification that you are working with such a great scientific level of um, just unbelievable people like Steve, um, our executive director of GBAC, Patty, Patty Ollinger, Dr. Gavin McGregor, the list goes on. And it's a true partnership <laughs> with regards in us working with you in getting your GBAC star accreditation. 
Um, so we're going to have Steve, my colleague, kind of give you a little quick overview of the actual accreditation program. We like to say it's a little bit like LEED, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with LEED for buildings, um, but it's not nearly as LEED takes a little bit longer and can be very, very extensive. Um, this is really an incredible program and you really are following the top level of protocols. But here again, we, know we want facilities to reopen. We know we want consumers and the business travelers back in these places and establishments. And we really want to make a safe customer journey for everyone as they go through each destination in incredible cities like Dallas. All right, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. All right, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try to take control of the, the screen here, Raul. All right. So as Raul and Kim said, this is, this is a partnership. Um, what we're, we're looking to accomplish here is, is a sense of community, which I think Visit Dallas has done the best job uh, throughout the country that I'm aware of in terms of pulling together as a community to try to do what's right for the greater good. Um, so our executive director, Patty Olinger here, um, She's, on, she's hosting another webinar right now, but what, what truly separates us uh, from, from some other um, third party accreditations popping up is, is really these people on these screen as well as uh, many, many others uh, of the contacts that these people have um, throughout their experience. Uh, Dr. Gravin, uh, Gavin McGregor Skinner, um, works with governmental agencies, teaches at Penn State, teaches at Harvard as a doctor of infectious disease. Um, same with, with Dr. Paul Meach and Dr. Stefan Wagner. These are resources that we have uh, that I don't think anybody else can, can compare to. Um, so when Kim talks about the scientific background, uh, these are the guys that we're talking about. These are, are the, the tools that we have available to help create a system for each of your facilities that um, get you to the highest level standards of cleaning and disinfecting. Uh, Patty was just at uh, down in Orlando for a together again um, symposium get together that she spoke at. And that was the, one of the biggest points that she took away is uh, the mayor was there. All the leaders in the community were there uh, because that's what it's going to take in order to get, to get our communities back together as everyone pulling together. Um, one of the things that we all can agree on with a sense of community is, is going out to eat, going out and, and getting in your city and, and seeing the different food cultures out there. Um, I know personally, I've eaten at Pecan Lodge one time in Deep Ellum and, and it, all it did was make me want to come experience more in the community of Dallas. So and forgive me for my Midwestern pronunciation of Pecan, uh, but it was fantastic and, and I just want to come back and do that. So. Uh, I think what we're doing here with Visit Dallas is incredibly important uh, to getting back to that level of normalcy. So what we've done with the GBAC STAR program, this was uh, something that was planned to be rolled out this fall regardless. Uh, and then the pandemic hit and we realized this is something that we need to push forward and, and start helping people with uh, getting back together. So what GBAC has historically done is a lot of in-person training, face-to-face, -face, um, a lot of forensic type restoration from crime scenes to hoarding, to mass casualty situations, uh, and now to a pandemic type situation. So what we're focusing on is what we like to call the frontline workers of prevention, where you, you have your frontline workers in, in your hospitals and your doctor's offices trying to treat. We're trying to help the frontline workers prevent. Um, so that's where we, we get into this whole STAR accreditation to try um, and, and look at a program from, from a whole systemic standpoint of how do we have the best practices that we can possibly have within this industry of cleaning and disinfecting to prevent. Um, so this, this system will have 20 elements um, that we follow. Uh, some of your, your hotels I know I've looked at in Dallas, um, the Westin is uh, has recently been accredited. I've, I'm working on the Sheraton right now uh, and they're doing a fantastic job. And I think a lot of your 
your industries and the and the different facilities are coming up with their own specific protocols to try and get back and open and, and to try and uh, get back to normal. And, and this is just a piece of that to make sure that we're taking all of that hard work that everybody's doing at home um, to try and think of every possible scenario that we can um, that, that gets your guests and, and your employees back to work safely. Um, so ultimately, also what we want to do is, is allow people to feel empowered. We don't want this to be a system where, you know, we're not, we're not the cleanliness police. Okay. We don't want to come in and, and everybody sweep everything under the rug to try to prove that you're doing the right thing. We want this to be a collaborative effort between the two of us to where we can build confidence in each other and management and your frontline housekeeping, you're on the same page. Right, so we want, that's, that's the whole idea of this 20 element system is, is get everybody to be their own kind of microbial and uh, virus experts uh, and understand what it's gonna take within your specific facility to prevent the transmission of, of any types of disease. Um, so with it being a, a partnership and an accreditation, this is something that is, uh, hot in the market where people want this so your consumers can have confidence in uh, understanding that you're not just validating yourself and saying that, hey, we've done a great job. This is somebody else helping you build a successful system uh, to create that level of, of comfortability of, of entering a facility as, as Michael and Raul have already said. Uh, so who have we been, been working with? Uh, so far, I mean, in, in Dallas in particular, I know that like, the two hotels that I've mentioned, and I've also just received uh, AT&T Stadium, their submission. Uh, so I'm really excited to get into that. I know that RFK and, and Lincoln Financial in Philadelphia are, are hot on your trail too. So I'm, I'm trying to, to let the Cowboys be the first in the NFC East to get this thing done. Um, I know I, I'm, I'm waiting for, for the call from Mr. Cuban, to see what he wants to do. There you go, Steve. Yeah, and we'll we had our first restaurant from the area there too that just yes, got accredited. So house. kudos to the Mercury Chop House. That was, that was amazing. They were the first restaurant. So very impressive to see. So we're, we're tailoring this to every possible industry that we can. You know, we're, we're starting to work with some school districts on getting their, you know, that's, that's everybody's question right now is, how are we going to do school in the fall? Um, so things like that. We've got distribution centers, hotel spas, uh, American Airlines, as you stated. So we're, we're, we're expanding this to be as fluid as possible in terms of who we can accommodate. Um, so a little bit, a, a real basic overview of how this works. Uh, a facility would apply for the accreditation. They put 50% down. Um, and there's, there's different pricing models for different industries, different uh, hotels have a different uh, pricing model than an arena. Uh, once, once that application goes in, you'll receive all the resources to help guide you through this whole process. There's uh, a 20 step handbook. Um, what we're seeing is, is some people need a little bit help, more help than others. So we're, we're in the process of developing some some more comprehensive templates to help people walk through this and, and understand it a little bit more. Um, ideally, we want your, your housekeeping involved, your management involved, your engineering involved, your facilities people involved. If, if you just um, kind of knock this down to the newest intern on the team to get this done, it's, it's much harder to be successful when we're, when we're walking through this because we do want this to be comprehensive and, and of high quality. Uh, so when you do receive that accreditation, it, it actually means something. Um, so this isn't a, a pass or fail situation. This is, again, a completely collaborative um, program where it's not, you, you don't just uh, submit your program and I say pass or fail. It is, we're going to work through this thing until you get that accreditation. I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to allow somebody to do all that work to, to not receive it. So um, once, once our review, our collaborative review has taken place and, and we get all the, the program set, 
um, you'll be able to uh, receive that media kit, put out a press release, and you know, put the put the sticker on the door. Um, but don't let that stop you from once you apply saying, "Hey, we are in the process of receiving this accreditation." You know that that's um, a, a good tool to use in and of itself to just say we're working towards this. It tells people that you are you're committed to doing this. Um, that's that's the STAR program in a nutshell. Again, 20 elements. Uh, it's it's a partnership, and we want it to be, and um, we we want to get Dallas back up and running as smoothly as we can. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Is this come back to me now, gentlemen, ladies? Well, I, I very much appreciate this. You know, uh, just last week um, uh, in in Full Service Restaurant Magazine, FSR, um, an article by Kurt Teicher talked about the restaurants must elevate their safety culture, not just their protocols, but their safety culture and how they think all the way, top to bottom, recognize that this is a, a long-term problem, not a short-term problem, and it involves many elements. So it's it's very good to hear ISSA's program here and how it might be going from the large venues and the hotels also to the restaurants. I do want to mention, however, that you do have a little com competition. The uh, Texas Restaurant Association and Dallas College are offering a, uh, the Texas Restaurant Promise certification program as well. It's designed to ensure that uh, employees understand everything to do with the CDC protocols. And, uh, and, and thanks to a grant from the Texas Workforce Commission, uh, the first 500 restaurants, 500 restaurants that signed up with the Texas Restaurant Promise certification program will be able to be admitted through their program for free. And you can find out more about that if you're a restaurant at the Texas Restaurant Association's website, txrestaurant.org. Um, I don't see, I see a couple of questions here. Let me see if I can see. I do see that some folks want to know what this would look like for public parks. One of our participants with uh, Downtown Dallas Inc. wants to know what would a cleaning protocol look like for a public park? We'll take that one question, then I'll do some wrap up and uh, I'll let everybody know that this presentation will be parked on our website in case they want to see the slides, etc. But Steve, do you want to talk about how, the, how can this be applied to a public park? Sure, so that's an interesting one, especially with it being outdoors, which is helps. Um, but depending on if it's a city park or a private park, um, looking at usage, frequency of occupancy, what, what are the crowds like? How do we limit uh, spacing of people? You know, as we know the, the transmission of COVID-19 is primarily through person-to-person -person contact. Um, so understanding how we can limit that. Um, we would walk through different tools and equipment and different chemistries that uh, maybe more applicable to to outside environments, harsher environments than maybe inside, you know, in in AT and T Stadium. Um, but working through the entire step twenty step program um, with a science based backing is is really the key. All right. So, that's valuable. Well, I do want to thank, you know, we, we promised people today some insights on the latest customer metrics and customer data. And I was very intrigued, Michael. I was like going, really getting into my nerd space when you're looking at the mobile data about how people are moving around and uh, uh, who was local and who was not and where they were going. And, and uh, so, the, so we wanted to talk about that. We wanted to talk about the role of customer confidence and in making sure that customers feel good to come back to your business and what part of the business is here that you can grab and attract. Uh, I do want to thank uh, Kim and Steve and Raul and Michael. Let me share one thing uh, next week. I can't bring it up anymore. Next week, um, um, we're going to do another, another webinar. 24 Hour Dallas presents another webinar on August 3rd. This time, uh, we hope you'll join us at 530 because we're going in. We are, our webinar next week is on racism and the nighttime economy. This comes up out of some concerns we have heard from people who like to go out in Dallas. And uh, uh, our guest will include Dr. Ruben uh, May, who's a professor and author of a book called Urban Nightlife, Entertaining Race, Class, and Culture in Public Spaces. Plus we have several Dallas nighttime influencers, including the Kenny Reeves, 
and Aaron Bradley and others, and my partner at the 24-Hour Dallas Volunteer, Drew Green, um, we're going to talk about the, the barriers for some communities in going to some businesses and what some businesses can do to compensate for that and uh, um, uh, reopen their own thinking in terms of bias and prejudice. And then we're going to introduce 24-Hour Dallas's new initiative that will help uh, racial prejudice in Dallas's nightlife. So I hope you'll join us from one week from now. You can sign up at 24hourdallas.org. Again, my thanks to Michael, uh, Kim, Steve, Raul. Thank you for joining us. This uh, presentation will be posted at the 24-Hour Dallas website uh, on our media page um, within 24 hours. And um, uh, we invite anybody, any business, any individual, any agency to become a part of our mission to create a safe, vibrant, and diverse nighttime economy for visitors, residents, and businesses. So join us. It's free right now. Uh, go to 24hourdallas.org and we appreciate you for joining us. Thank you everyone and cheers.